Okay, let's let's welcome our next speaker, Robert Hurlbut, and he's talking about developing a threat modeling mindset. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Well, good morning. I've been uh, traveling quite a bit across country. Uh, seems like a lot of times I just drive to the airport and I fly 500 miles and then come back. It's one of the few times that I'm actually in my own state giving a talk in my own place. So I'm living in uh, Enfield, Connecticut. So it was actually an easier drive this morning than getting on a plane and flying somewhere to, to do this. So um, glad to be with you this morning. So a little bit about myself. I am a long time software developer, architect. Uh, worked with a lot of teams over the years. Uh, a lot of, uh, as an independent consultant, working with a lot of projects, finance, healthcare, government, many other industries. And just recently though, I, after 15 years of being independent, I'm now working for another company. Or, and so I'm no longer independent, but uh, finishing out a, a set of uh, talks that I'm giving at various places on threat modeling. And so uh, welcome here today. Uh, again, about me, I also am a co-host of the Application Security Podcast. I'm not sure if you've heard of it or, or seen anything about it, but uh, it's something we've been doing for now over a year. And we've had a, two, a couple seasons and some really interesting uh, podcast interviews out there. So I uh, welcome you to check it out. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of threat modeling before you came here today? Okay. How many of you, that's a very new concept. You don't know much about it today. Okay. A couple of you, great. Uh, how many of you are using it today in your day-to-day -day work or, or often in your own work now? Let's say often, because to me, if you're going to do threat modeling, you need to do it a lot uh, in, in terms of how you think and how you, you go about your, your work. You need to be thinking about threat modeling, or at least the way the potential threats are coming into your system quite often. And also maybe how many have you an actual program of threat modeling in your, okay, excellent. Uh, yeah, of course you do <laughs> in the back there, Brian. Um, so great. I hope that at, at the end of this and certainly going forward, this is something you're going to consider more in putting in place into your own organization, into your own um, programs and, and teams and so on. So this is a, um, something I saw on Twitter recently from Miko Hypanen, who is the CTO of F-Secure. And he's been, it's funny, he's been retweeting things that he wrote in 2012, five years later, and they all seem to be very, very relevant. But this one in particular, it's just not fair when the attackers cheat. They really should be regulated to attack our defenses only the way we want them to. Anybody ever felt that way? <laughs> you know, what is the deal? Why do they keep doing things we don't want them to do? Why aren't they playing by the rules? Why aren't they uh, following some kind of guideline that we put out there instead of doing something different or trying something different? But, you know, the reality is they're not. They're, they're thinking of other ways, of new ways to try to get in, get in. Now, the reality is there's a lot of attacks that are, are just the basic stuff, right? We're not patching, so they figure out what the patch is or the opposite and do that to get in, very simple stuff. But there are things that we find that are really clever and uh, interesting. And so in terms of trying to defend our systems, we have to think differently in order to try to, to, to defend. And so that's where I think about you know, this, this idea of a security mindset, or as we'll go further, into a threat modeling mindset. And in particular, Bruce Schneer wrote about this uh, back in 2008 in a post. Everybody familiar with Bruce Schneer? heard the name. He's a well-known cryptographer many years ago. He's written a lot of good books uh, on cryptography, but also uh, more recently, more popular security books out there on data and other kinds of things. And in particular, he wrote this, that security requires a particular mindset. Professionals, security professionals, at least the good ones, see the world differently. How many of you can relate to that? that once you got into security, maybe you were before doing something else, but once you got into security and the more you're into security, you see things differently. Uh, you see an open door and you go, oh, what's going on there? Maybe that's something we need to take, take care of. 
or you see um, certain ports open and say, well, you know, why are they open? That doesn't make sense. So you think of things and you see things very differently. A little bit later, he wrote another blog post in 2012 about teaching that to others. So we in the security field, if you've been there for a little while, uh, at some point you realize that there's others that need to know this as well. It can't be just a few of us that have this knowledge and this understanding. We've got to teach others. And he pointed to a story about, or in a paper actually, about a couple of uh, instructors at a Naval Academy that had uh, a class of teaching cybersecurity to students. And one of the things that they did was uh, they came to this, the class and they said, all right, tomorrow we're going to have a pop quiz or a test. And what it is is we're going to tell you what it is, and we want you to uh, pass. However you do it, whatever you need to do, pass it. But the, the test is write pi, 3.14159265, all the way down to 100 decimal places on the test. And we want you to cheat. <laughs> we want you to come in and figure out a way to get 100 on this test. And so the next day, they gave the test, and, and sure enough, everybody passed. But the ways that they figured out how to pass were really interesting. For example, somebody had on the ceiling tile written out pi, so they just looked up and wrote it. Somebody else had a little plate with a donut or something, and then you lift the donut, and there was pi written on the plate in a, a little a sheet of paper. Somebody brought a book with the back cover. It was a book by the author, and they said, oh, there's my book, except on the back cover they had written out pi. <laughs> and so you couldn't really tell that it was actually part of the book cover. And all kinds of other creative ways in order to cheat and pass this test, not the normal way of doing things. And one of the quotes that Bruce Schneer pointed to from that paper was this one. To teach your students, yourself and your students, to cheat, we've always been taught to color inside the lines, stick to the rules, and never, ever cheat. In seeking cybersecurity, you must drop that mindset. And so that's what I'm talking about is that we already know the attackers. We already know they're trying to cheat. They're trying to circumvent the controls we have in place. They're trying to get around the things that we're doing to try to protect our systems. In order to circumvent that or in order to deal with that, we have to also think in a similar way. And I believe, you know, think outside the box essentially. So that's what I'm thinking about is that, you know, that security mindset that thinking outside the box, thinking differently than we normally do. And I think that's really, again, where threat modeling comes in, is helping us to think in a bigger picture about our system, what are the potential threats, and how are some ways that we can deal with it. And again, think about you know, maybe how an attacker would look at this, uh, maybe some ways that our defenses are not set up correctly that we need to think a little bit better about, and so on. So what is threat modeling? Well, threat modeling, to me, is something we already do. If you're locking the door to your house, you're putting down the windows, you're uh, locking the doors to your car, you're already thinking about these things because as you move away from those places, you, know, you leave your house, you leave your car, you're already thinking about, well, what could somebody do if they came upon my house or my car and see that I've got belongings in my car and so on? You're already thinking about some things, and in particular, you're thinking about you know, what could go wrong? What are the risks here of leaving things out in the open and so on and acting accordingly? And we, again, we do this a lot throughout our personal lives. We, we think about ways that something could happen, something could go wrong, and that's essentially what threat modeling is. You're thinking about what could go wrong and now what do I do now that I know that information or have that information? You're probably hopefully, already doing these things in your security strategy. How about pen testing? You have those? Okay. Vulnerability assessments, something like that. Uh, DAS tools, SAS tools, running those kinds of things against source code and, and running systems and so on. And then a lot of other automated tools. Hopefully you're doing a lot of those logging we talked about a little bit earlier in the, in the previous session. If you're not doing threat modeling, though, you're missing a lot. And I can say that with confidence because guess what? Your pen test is never really going to understand fully your business process. All it's going to ever really find are the things on the outside and test a few things, but it's not going to really know, for example, that your password is stored 
with an MD5 or a SHA-1. It won't know that. It has no clue. It won't know certain things and decisions that you made inside your system. It just won't. Same thing with vulnerability assessments. It may find a few vulnerabilities, and certainly that can maybe give it a clue about the kinds of threats that might be in your system, but it won't know all the business processes. It won't know all the decisions that you made underneath. And the same thing with you know, checking your code. You'll find some things, but it won't tell you everything. And that's, again, where threat modeling comes in, where you're giving a more holistic view of what's my secure design, not at the code level, but at the bigger picture, what are some things that we have made decisions about or will be making decisions about in how we build out our application or our system. And so by definition, it's essentially that process of understanding your system and the potential threats against your system. I like to think of it as critical thinking about security. A typical threat model includes these four things. Uh, you can see variations of them, but this is what I like to include if I, if I can, if I'm working with a team, is that understanding of the system. That may include a drawing of some sort, a diagram of some sort, or at least an understanding of what is it that we're building, what is it that we're trying to protect, any identified threats that are, we might find in the system, any mitigations, countermeasures, and so on, and then also any risks associated with all those things we found and the priorities associated with those. So, for example, if I find 100 threats, I'm not going to fix all 100 necessarily. Maybe some things are more critical than others. And so the risk managing that and understanding that helps you in terms of uh, prioritizing work later on. So quick definitions, assets are the things we're trying to protect usually. That's what a lot of people focus on when they're uh, doing threat modeling sometimes is they think about, okay, what am I protecting? What are the things that are important to, to me and to others? We also think about the agent, you know, who is it that wants to get in and who is it that wants to do something uh, to our system. And so that could be a, a person, it could be a process that's, that's trying to get in. And by the way, they all look like that. So you have to have that in every, you know, at least in somewhere in the slide deck, some, somebody with that or, or the other one, which I have in a moment, you'll see. <laughs> the threat is anything that's going to exploit the vulnerability. And intentionally or accidentally, and that's kind of funny in a way because a lot of times we think about the intentional attacks and the intentional threats, but they're also accidental ones. I mean, we saw that a couple of days ago. I saw an article about, I think there was a, a problem with a fire extinguisher that, that took Azure down in Europe. Like, what? <laughs> and then AWS, I've seen that go down because of somebody hitting a server or doing something with a server incorrectly, and it took down AWS in a, a certain uh, large area. I mean, there are all kinds of things that can happen accidentally that actually can become threats. And you're like, well, what happens if somebody does this? Do I ever think about that? And ultimately, again, they can, you know, the threat itself can obtain damage or destroy an asset. Vulnerability is the flaw in the system that lets you realize the threat. So I like to think that, you know, there, some people use them interchangeably, but to me they're not. You know, the threat is realized because the vulnerability is present. If I'm able to mitigate the vulnerability, then the threat is also minimized. And so just understand that, you know, that we look at vulnerabilities, but in terms of threat modeling, we'd want to try to understand what is the threat. So I might have a SQL injection vulnerability in an application, in a website. Well, what's the threat here? Well, be, by using the SQL injection vulnerability, I'm able to get to the database and I'm able to retrieve data, I'm able to change tables, I'm able to do all kinds of things. If I'm able to mitigate the SQL injection problem, then I minimize the threat. And so those two kind of work together, but they're not the same thing. The other thing that also helps drive your threat modeling is risk and understanding risk and that potential of the of the loss, damage, destruction of that asset, and, and the threat realizing the, the vulnerability. And so that's very important, is understanding risk. And that helps drive a lot of things that we do in security anyway. I don't know about you, but I think the mouse has a chance. How about you? Yes, he does. He does. And this is the other, the other thing you have to have in a slide, is, is this guy with the, uh, you know, the cowl and everything. And the, um, the attack is a motivated, sufficiently skilled threat agent. And I like to think about this in terms of that can vary uh, among uh, different areas. The motivations can be very different. You know, the nation state hacker can be very different than the, the hacktivist, the, the person who's trying to make a point with your site and changing it. Uh, and then, of course, the sufficiently skilled 
threat agent, you know, that can vary as well. It can be a script kitty that we all used to hear about years ago, all the way up into the nation state ha hackers and attackers that are essentially on a job. I mean, they're paid <laughs> salary. They have, uh, you know, if you ever watch, they say that um, in some places, if you watch where the attackers are com coming from, they have certain hours just like we do, eight hours that they're working and doing their job because they have a job. They go in, they attack, they, they go home, and they get their paycheck or something like that. Uh, very funny and interesting. But all of these, again, taking advantage of a vulnerability. In terms of vocabulary, this is something that uh, John Stephen uh, put together uh, some time ago. It just shows you how everything is kind of related to each other, and that's important just to understand in terms of this, this whole idea of threat modeling. A few approaches to threat modeling. One is the software-centric, which is the one I focus mostly on. I work with developer teams a lot and trying to help them understand uh, the the process, understand, okay, what is it that we're doing in the system? How does it interact with other things? And then build our, our threat model from that. And it's focused, again, on secure design. It's focused on uh, data flow diagrams, which we'll see in a moment. Another way is this asset-centric way. A lot of times people use asset, or sorry, attack trees to try to figure out how do I get from point A to point B to finally get to my goal and kind of a decision tree to get there. Uh, I will see that some people say, well, I, that's how I start with an asset, and that's okay. In certain, in certain cases, it makes a lot of sense, especially if you have a system that's already been built. But if you have nothing built yet and you're starting from scratch, you may say, for example, I want to build an e-commerce site. Well, okay, what are you going to do with that? Well, I want to have credit cards. I want to take credit cards. I'm going to take payments. Well, where are you going to store it? Well, I may either store it in a database that I own, and then I'm going to do my own PCI compliance and all those kinds of things. Or I may say, I don't want to manage that. I want to move it off to somewhere else. And now those assets are somewhere else. And, uh, and somebody else is handling that. So then your threat model can be very different depending on if you host the asset or you let somebody else host the asset. So I like to say that for asset-centric threat modeling, it's, I think it's more in line if you already have something. But if you're designing from scratch, I like to look at the process first, and then you'll uncover where the assets go. And then finally, another way is the attacker-centric method, which is basically focusing on the profile of the attacker, the different patterns that they're using. Uh, sometimes I'll use this as well, but I use it at the very end. I like to try to figure out all the other things first and then figure out, okay, who's interested in this, and see if that might filter out my threat model to maybe point to some things that are more likely in, in this uh, particular system. Uh, this is something that I, I've been thinking about for a little while, is teach threat modeling to your teams. You know, conduct training in your companies, like, so, sort of like what we're doing here. Help teams threat model their own projects. Work with them. Uh, if you haven't done this before, uh, just sitting down with a group of developers or, or engineers, other engineers, system engineers, and thinking through a lot of these things, I find that it's really beneficial. There are some things that maybe they didn't even realize about the entire system. You know, maybe for a developer, they're working on the UI. They don't know how the database works. Uh, the middle tier doesn't know how the UI and the, and the database necessarily works, or at least uh, fully, and how it may interact with other parts of the system. But if you have a team and, and put them together and, and try to build a threat model, you'll find that there's a lot of things that they learn really well. And then encourage beginning threat modeling with each project, each new feature. So you may have never done this, and teams may never have done this before, but if you uh, encourage them that now, okay, now you know something about threat modeling, now let's continue to do this and, and add it to every new thing that you do, um, that's also another way of, of making sure that threat modeling is integrated throughout your system. And then follow up, make sure that they, they understand it, make sure they're working with it. I'm working with some teams that have made commitments to say that now every team must have a threat model. Every project must have a threat model. And it must be reviewed and, and so on. So it's that encouragement that, you know, it's not just something we talk about, but it's something that we do. So a typical threat modeling session, like if I was doing a workshop and, um, you know, it's a hands-on, what we usually do is we try to figure out what's the domain, who, who knows what's going on in the system, get the team together, not just one person's job, how many of it is just one person's job to do security today? 
you know, that's all, you know, just one person doing everything. Go figure out the rest of our system. Anybody doing that? Yeah, probably. Uh, my goal is not to do that. My goal is to try to get people together and because they know it better than you do, typically. You know, the developers know something. And when you do that and you get a team together and you ask the, the architect, how's this set up? What's your system look like? And the, the architect says, well, it does this and it does that. And the developers say, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, not really. There are a couple things that we changed. There are a couple uh, shortcuts that we took that were not so obvious. And so everybody learned something from that. Also, focus on business and technical goals. The business goals may be different than your security goals. For example, I remember working with a, a financial company where we talked about Im implementing some kind of two-factor authentication for their users. And they had two sets of users, the admin or managers and regular users. And we talked about that. I said, you need to have that for everybody. I mean, this is a financial company. Why don't you have it already? That's my goal. They said to me that, you know, we have different schedules. What we'd like to do is try to put two-factor authentication in for the managers first, get that in place, see how that works, and then eventually get the users because, you know, we just want to gradually get them there. That was their business goal. Slightly different than my security goal, but that's okay. And that you know, we built a threat model around that, that, okay, here's our time period here, and here's our time period here, that our threat model may change as a, as a result. Technical goals, you know, everybody makes a decision about uh, platforms, about uh, products that they're using, about third-party libraries. Uh, for example, Struts. I know there's a company that we hear about in the news lately that, you know, made a decision about Struts. Whatever, you know, third-party <laughs> library that you select, it impacts your threat model. It impacts what you're doing because every third-party library or anything else that you bring in, they now become your responsibility and they change your threat model. They change the things that potentially could make you vulnerable in your system based on the fact that you made a decision of bringing that in. And so now you need to understand how does that impact your threat model for your particular application or your particular system. And so really, Threat modeling must support all these goals, uh, not the other way around. You don't come in and say, well, you know, I, who cares what you want to do? Let's do it this way. No, you need to understand where everybody else is coming from and then understand, okay, can we meet somewhere where security is important, but it also helps support what you're doing as well. Meeting dates and times, uh, pretty focused sessions I like to do. And then very important, I've learned this over time, is you know, be honest, leave ego at the door, and no blaming because when you're doing this discovery situation or session, you, you want to make sure that people are not uh, feeling like, oh, I can't talk about this, I can't say it because then everybody will point at me and say, you know, why did you mess that up? Why did you not do it right? Or what did you? No, it's really about discovery. So I always say, you know, be honest. And, and, you know, if it's something that was wrong, say it. And now you know, and now you can go fix it. So very simple tools to start with, really. Uh, there is no tool today, an automated tool of some sort, that I can fire up and point to my system and, and push a button and say, build me a threat model. It doesn't happen. Instead, you, you really need to, need to understand the process. And even the tools that are out there, you need to understand something about the process to use them. And I always say the, the simplest thing is the simplest thing, whiteboard, uh, some kind of graphing tool to record what you, what you drew and what you came up with, um, Word or Excel or something like that to record your findings. Uh, there's a, a great resource from Dennis Cruz that's out there. It's this page, simple page, to re record your drawing, uh, record some information, threats and so on, and then on the back, uh, some information about you know, basic threat modeling and, and, for example, Stride, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and different things like that. And I, I like to hand these out when I do a workshop, a training workshop where people are doing hands-on. I just hand this out so they can look at this and it helps them understand the concepts. You can record things in a simple way, as I said. Uh, this is an example worksheet that I've used where you record the threats, um, the countermeasures that you find, some follow-up. And this ID I like to record uh, just to relate back to, if you wanted to, to JIRA or something like that where you're tracking these kinds of things. Several tools out there. There's the uh, most famous, I guess, or well-known is the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool, which is a Windows-based tool. Uh, but there's some others. Uh, the Threat Modeler, the Iris Risk uh, tools are pay tools. The Threat Modeling Tool is free, but these other two are not. 
And then the latest one is this OWASP Threat Dragon, which is a really interesting project, OWASP project. It's a free tool uh, that's in progress right now that's out there. So to get started, when I'm working with a team and helping them understand threat modeling, I like to go over the security principles, defend in depth, and uh, least privilege, and so on, uh, being reluctant to trust, and, and so on, just to make sure that they have some kind of ground, grounding. A great paper I like to point to is this uh, IEEE, Computer Society Center for Secure Design, avoiding the top 10 software security design flaws. A lot of people have heard about OWASP top 10. This one kind of uh, looks at that in a similar way in terms of top 10 something, but in this case, it's security flaws, design flaws. So for example, not getting cryptography correct and you know, mixing up authentication authorization. A lot of people do that where they'll reverse them or they'll uh, think that their authentication is the same thing as the authorization, it's not. And so it um, talks about that a lot, but mainly what it's, what it's doing is trying to point out the difference between a bug and a flaw. A bug's an implementation level uh, software problem, so there's a mistake that's been made, an N plus one type of problem, versus a flaw where you've made a decision at some point that has impacted your design. So. Uh, for example, as I mentioned before, a common one I see is, and I ask this of all teams, what are you doing to store passwords? What are you using? And many times I'll see a company that's been around for 10 years or more, and they tell me, I'm using MD5. <laughs> I'm using SHA-1. And, and does anybody ever know that? Did anybody? No, actually nobody really knew that, uh, except for you know, the people that are using it and developers and so on. And so that, again, is a flaw in your design made some time ago, and now you've got to think about, well, how does that impact my design and uh, my application or my system today? And so now we get into the actual process itself, the threat modeling process itself. And the way I like to, to do this, again, I'm a software uh, person, and, and I focus a lot on software applications and design for secure systems. But uh, this is the way I followed. It follows a lot of others that have uh, said the same thing or the way they've done this. Essentially is understand your system. You know, what are you building? What is that that's out there? Uh, the threats. And I like to use these questions and answers. Just ask questions, probing questions at times. And then determine the mitigations, the countermeasures, and the risks. And then some kind of follow through. So don't just go through the exercise, but actually, you know, have a follow up for it. Anybody have a guess what this is? Yeah, sure. It's a website. Anybody ever seen one of these, been handed one of these and say, this is our system? Yeah, the three layer, tier, three tiered layers, uh, great, yeah. How much do I know about the security of this system though? <laughs> Not much at all. One thing I do know, it's got HTTPS. That's all I need to know, right? I'm, I'm, I'm good. Oh, that's true. That's true. Very good. So now I know a little bit more, right? <laughs> now I know a little bit more about the security of the system. Yeah, now you know you got problems. Now I know you got problems. <laughs> I may have more than that, but... <laughs> well, the reality is, as I said, you're not going to know much about this at all. And if somebody gives you this, you know, from a team and says, hey, this is our application, that's not enough. You need to understand a little bit more about the different decisions that are made inside the system, the different business processes, and how they're impacted by security or impacting security. One way to do that, and this is a method that's come out um, a number of years ago, and, and people still talk about it, the data flow diagrams, but the reality is you can use whatever. I, I don't really care. Uh, if, a, if I'm working with a team and I ask them, give me a diagram of something. Show me something. Go, you know, show me a firewall. Show me... Um, you know, network devices or whatever. I don't care how you do it, it doesn't matter to me, but show me something so that we can at least have a discussion about what's there and see how things move across the system and then we can ask some questions about it. But this is one way, especially for software uh, applications you'll see, is this data flow diagram and the idea being that uh, this nomenclature, we use uh, external entity to represent um, a user or some kind of uh, somebody using the system in some way, a process or multi-processes. So let's say uh, send email. Okay, that's a process. And how is that done? Data store, two lines, uh, some kind of straight line with an arrow of some sort pointing where the data flows through the system. 
And then there's also this concept of a trust boundary, which is an interesting thing. Um, it represents the idea that on one part of my system it's untrusted and another part of my system it's trusted. Maybe there's authentication happening across the system. Maybe there's a, uh, some access control of some sort. Um, others can also have said that it's kind of a, a, a act, oh, sorry, a um, attack surface. It represents something that uh, where you're more vulnerable. Uh, for example, you know, what's your what's your um, attack surface of a submarine? Well, it's the outside, right? It's the hull. But is that the only attack surface? No. no. There are many inside. For example, the captain's safe. And so you can identify many different places in your system where you're more vulnerable, where you're exposing uh, systems, exposing through, uh, you know, ports and so on and things like that. And so this dotted line kind of helps you understand and identify some areas that are more sensitive than other places. So as I said, uh, drawing this kind of stuff helps you understand uh, bits of your system and where the data is flowing. Um, so you get started, you say, okay, let's, let's start at a high level view. <coughs> is um, I've got users and I've got admins. Okay, those are a couple of users or interactors within our system, entities, if you will, in our system. I have a server that represents a lot of processes that are happening inside. And I've got data flow that's moving around in, in the system and some boundaries here as well. Uh, that's a high level view. Ideally, you want to move in a little further. And so going back to that idea of the, the web application, more than likely there's other things going on. There's a lot of services that are being called. There's a lot of uh, databases or files and so on that may be involved inside the application. And so you want to try to draw some of that. And ideally, when I'm working with a team, I may even go a little further than this, and I might say, let's look at the authentication service. There may be five other things that are going on there, and let's kind of drill into that and see what's going on there, and so on. But at some point, you start with a high level, and then you drill a little further in. And so once you've started to draw your, your diagram, the next thing you want to do is uh, label some of these things about what is happening. You know, there's a request going on here. Uh, there's some audit data being saved to the, from the audit service to the, the database where the audit tables are and so on, and those kinds of things. Uh, may be happening. And then you want to decide or determine, you know, where are some boundaries? Where are some places that we're more vulnerable? Our attack surface is, is more prominent. And then you might also identify, enumerate those kinds of things, especially if you have a larger model where it is, continues to have a lot of things added to it. And if you're diagramming this stuff, you might have numbers that represent things. And then on the side, you might say, okay, this is, these are the users, these are this process, and so on. So you do that sort of thing as well. And so at that point, you know, what we have there was just a diagram, not much different than an architecture diagram that you might receive, you know, from a group. Great. But it, but it helps you at least to get started. It's not your threat model yet. You know, some people will say, well, I've got a data flow diagram, therefore I've got a threat model. No. <laughs> you've got a data flow diagram. Or you've got a, some kind of representation of your system. That's all you have. Next step is really to understand what the threats are, which, of course, is the most important part of threat modeling. It's also most difficult in many ways to do this. One way, as I mentioned earlier, is the attack trees, is to figure out a decision tree. You know, I want to get to something, and how do I get there? If I want to do a, um, a CSRF attack, what needs to be in place in order to get there and, and be able to execute it, as an example? You can look at some threat libraries to help you think about the kinds of threats that you might have in a system. Uh, different checklists that are available out there. You can also use use cases and misuse cases. Uh, for example, a use case would be, as a user, I want to be able to log into the system. A misuse case, as a user, I should not be able to log in as an admin or should not be able to have access to admin pages if I'm not logged in. I like to say that misuse cases really help you with this. You ever heard that before? <laughs> If you're, you're mentioning a scenario and they come back and say, well, no one would ever do that, right? And who would ever do that? And why would they ever do that? Nobody would ever think about doing that. Well, that helps you in terms of, again, developing your threat model to understand what is maybe possible and also what's plausible. I mean, those are, there's some differences between the two. Do you know that? Possible and plausible? Possible that on Mars I might be attacked by a bear. Is it plausible? Probably not. <laughs> You know, there are not very many bears, as far as I know, on Mars, if I go to Mars. But there's a possibility there is one, but the plausibility of it is probably not likely. And so 
kind of helps you with that to think about you know, what could happen and what's really likely to happen. Uh, most well known in threat modeling is this use this, this uh, mnemonic called STRIDE that helps you think about threats essentially. So spoofing, pretending to be somebody else, uh, tampering is, is really dealing with uh, data that's been modified in some way, repudiation, somebody claiming or claiming that they haven't done something that they have or haven't done something, information disclosure, exposing that information, denial of service, of course, uh, affecting availability, and then elevation of privilege, which is the most dangerous one, which is somebody being able to do things that they're not supposed to be able to do. And really the opposite of that is what we want. You know, that's what we're trying to deal with and when we're doing the stride uh, method is, is to try to figure out the opposite things that are missing, which are for spoofing, authentication, tampering, we, we need to have some integrity, data integrity, repudiation, non-repudiation, or auditing and logging, if you will. Information disclosure, we want some confidentiality in place that may not be there. Denial of service, of course, availability we want. Elevation of privilege is authorization or access control. And if you've been in security a while, hopefully you recognize these things. They're the CIA, right? The confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The two A's, the authentication and authorization. And then finally, the non-repudiation, or somebody, some people call it auditing. So maybe three A's there. And so that's really what we're trying to help people understand. And so when, when you teach stride to somebody who may not know security very well, what you're trying to do is help them understand the opposite of these things that might mean that I need to put these things in place to make sure that I've you know, been able to deal with the threats. Um, another way is to use this POSTA method, which is combining stride attacks and a lot of risk analysis. It's out there. There's a good book on that. Uh, the other thing I like to do when I'm doing a, a threat model with a team is just ask a lot of functional questions around these kinds of things as well, especially, for example, configuration management. I ask questions about cryptography. As I said, I always ask about passwords and encryption and key management and how are they doing those things. Uh, that are hidden, really, from the outside world. You may not know that these things are happening, but they're there inside the secure design. So I ask about those things. I ask about, for example, uh, going back to the attacker, who would be interested in these things, uh, what kind of goals that they might have, assets and so on that are, that are available, different methods they might use, and then also are there any attack surfaces, anything that we've missed as we're going through a threat model. I ask about authentication between callers and services, um, you know, again, authorization. So I may ask those specifically, cryptography and, and so on. Uh, one of the best questions, and I heard this yesterday, I was at a, a, a couple days at a conference and this kept coming up, but is there anything keeping you up at night? <laughs> and this uh, person was giving a keynote and they kept saying, these are the things that keep me up at night, these are the things that keep me up at night. So I kind of knew what, what was keeping her up at night. but. Um, you know, that's an interesting question to ask a team. You know, is there something that you're not telling us? Is there something that we need to know about? For example, a back door that's in the system, a test button that's still there, you know, a debug setting that you just didn't realize was there. I remember working with a team and they told me that, you know, actually we have this way of testing our site that we keep live all the time because it's really easier to have it out there in production so that we can test all these things about our site, but oh yeah, that's right, it's in production. Yeah, well, we don't have a link to it. What do you mean? Okay, but it's still there. I mean, does it need to be there? I mean, <laughs> really? So that can impact your threat model as well. Here's an example I like to, uh, when I'm talking with uh, teams that are they're focused so much on microservices these days, is this idea of the uh, confused deputy problem. Um, everybody recognize this guy? Sure. Okay. Remember how sometimes he would be, um, somebody's in the jail cell and, and, hey, can you help me out? Can you give me the key? I need to go to the, the bathroom or something. Yeah, sure, here you go. Go ahead. And then somehow another Barney gets locked in the jail, right? Um, and that happens quite often in the, in the episodes. Well, the idea behind the confused deputy problem is that you have a lot of services that are out in the system and some that are um, doing one thing and anonymous essentially and then others that are more secure they at least they should be and they're doing more privileged operations and the idea being that if I can say A calls B calls C and sees the the secure operation what's to prevent me from A calling C or you know making B do something that it shouldn't do and call D or something like that 
And so th there's some interesting things about that, and, and we've seen this a, a few times in examples. And the way to deal with that is, you know, through Act's uh, permissions and capabilities and so forth. But the idea is that there's some potential implied trust that's in the system that we may not realize is there. And so it, it, it's something that comes up quite often. Talking about configuration management, if we look back at my uh, web um, DFD that I put together, if you look at and think about you know, where the configuration, where's configuration happening for a website, typically it's in data files, config files of some sort. What's contained in those files, typically? Secrets, passwords, web services, other kinds of things that they're calling, right? And so if I want to do a threat model against that, I would ask, uh, or first of all, you know, identify you have configuration files in your system, and then I would review, okay, what are some security principles here? Uh, be reluctant to trust, assume secrets not safe. And with that in mind, then I ask some questions. How does the app handle those files? And do, what do they do with those files? Because it's still data input. You know, we think a lot about the input that comes from the outside, but we don't always think about the input that comes from the inside, you know, from our files and from our databases. You know, have you heard of uh, reflective, uh, or stored rather, XSS, right? Being able to store an XSS attack in the database and then simply uh, pulling that data back into the website and then, and then acted on the website. So it's all data input. So how does it use those configuration files and what would happen if somebody changed something in those files? You know, change uh, to point to a different database or change the password or change to point to a different service. What would happen? How do we know? Is there some kind of implied trust? Usually there is. Possible controls and mitigation, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, you'd set permissions on those configuration files. Who's changing them, perhaps? And then validate all the data that goes into those files to make sure that um, you know, it's valid and so forth, using test, fuzz testing and so on. So like I said, a lot of different ways to identify threats and, and like I said I like to use these answers to questions and try to you know probe and what's going on with your system. Once you figured out the opposite of these things as I said spoofing you may say well, well now we need to know or we need to put in some authentication and so on. You have a few options what to do and these are pretty well known the four options leave it as is you found some problems leave it as is you know, we know it's broken leave it <laughs> it's okay. Uh, remove it you know, we know there's a problem here. We're just going to remove that particular feature so that it's not available yet until we fix it. You can remedy with a countermeasure. You can put something in place to, to deal with the issue. That's ideal. Uh, and then finally, there's the warn user, which I call the pass the buck method, uh, which is to give some kind of disclaimer and say, look, we know it's a problem. Use it at your own risk. Uh, if you go into a coffee shop with a Wi-Fi completely wide open, there's, again, you might see sometimes a disclaimer that says, by the way, use at your own risk. Anybody can sniff the, uh, the connection that you're making out there in the world when you're using our free Wi-Fi. So that's a warn user uh, method. So then you want to try to figure out, you know, what are the risks associated with the vulnerabilities and threats that you found? And sometimes you will kind of reverse. You'll find the risk first of the threat to then determine the mitigation or maybe the other way around. To define or to determine risk, essentially, you apply some kind of risk management. And I said very early on, you want to think about how risk drives a lot of your threat modeling. Different ways to do this. Uh, one is uh, that's actually becoming more and more popular is to use the FAIR approach. Have anybody heard of that? Okay, a few. Uh, certainly more prevalent nowadays in the financial industry. I, I keep saying it there. But it's a, a very um, analytical way of, of determining risks. Um, some other ways are uh, CVSS, another way of scoring a risk rating. And then uh, DREAD is one that used to be around with Microsoft, but they've dropped it lately where they try to figure out uh, risk that way. Uh, the simplest way is really just high, medium, low. And you'll see a lot of tools that use that. It's not very complicated, but um, it's definitely more subjective. I mean, really all you're doing there is you're trying to determine how easy is it to exploit this threat and then also the business impact as a result. So the ease of exploitation, high is if a lot of users can be um, uh, able to do this thing and, and low is if they need special skills. The business impact of a lot of users, for example, are impacted and your reputation 
and so on, very high, and versus low that not very many users and your reputation and so on is maybe not being impacted um, to, to a high degree. You put those two together and you can come up with at least, again, subjectively somewhat, but you know, what does we feel is the risk here in, in terms of our rating? Here's an example of a CSRF uh, attack or threat, and we say, okay, you know, here's our, the threat, here are the, the description of it, and some countermeasures, some things that it's affecting. We consider it to be a medium, and so that's, again, a threat model of, of that particular situation. Going back to our configuration management uh, issue, uh, if I think about the risk rating of this thing, I like to say that, you know, if we own the box, we're in control of it, uh, the risk may be actually more medium or low. If we're not in control of that file and the configuration that we're setting, uh, I would say, like, for example, on a cloud or some other service that we don't own, we don't manage, somebody else does, then I would say the risk rating on this particular situation is higher because uh, we need to make sure that we protect the data and, and make sure we know who changes the configuration files and so on. And so that's a threat model right there of all the things we know about the system, we know some principles, we've asked some questions, we've identified maybe, identified maybe some threats that could happen if somebody changes the file, we've identified some mitigations and we've also determined the risk and that helps us drive what we're gonna do next. Do we put these kind of things in place or do we say it's okay, we understand it's a risk, but we'll live with it, we're not gonna do anything more. So that's another part of our threat model here. Finally, the, the follow through is documenting what you found, filing bugs or requirements, uh, verifying they're fixed, and then also, uh, if we miss anything, review again. Now, when are you done with threat modeling? Never, yeah, you need to keep going, you need to keep doing this, you need to keep thinking. Anytime you add something new, you need to review it again. You need to look at your threat model. It changes your threat model. If you add a new library, if you add new devices, if you, um, you know, expand ports or whatever, your threat model has changed and you need to update it and, and keep it going. And so what I like to say is that as you do that, ultimately what you have is what I call this living threat model. It's not something, an exercise that you did one time and you're done, but it's something that you should be thinking about quite often, and again, as we said at the title of this, is that threat modeling mindset. This is something you need to be thinking about, just like you do on a personal basis every day, about your own systems. You need to be thinking about these things and helping to integrate it within your own system, your own company, and with a lot of people, not just the security people, I think, but also developers and others that, that should be uh, understanding about these principles. Finally, I want to leave this with you. Uh, this is really an interesting uh, article I saw uh, last year that came out from John Lambert, works at Microsoft. But in particular, he, he wrote this article pointing to the fact that the security controls themselves actually can create vulnerability. And why? Because it gives a clue to attackers what is important to you. And so what he wrote in this article, and, and I, I very much encourage you to go read it. It's, it's just uh, pretty eye-opening, especially having thought about some of these things, because a lot of times we think about, as security people, we think about lists, right? We got a checklist, and we add this control, and we have that control. An attacker doesn't think that way. An attacker thinks in graphs. They're trying to figure out from point A to point B to point C to figure out what's your system. They don't know everything in your system, so they've got to graph it out and figure it out, right? Well, how are they going to do that? Well, one way is to look at your controls, to figure out what is important to you that you now have a control protecting it because it's important to you. And so what he was saying in this article is that, you know, the selection of controls, just saying I have a control is not enough. Now I need to understand what happens if somebody circumvents that control. What's next? Where do they go next? Are you slowing them down? Are you monitoring them? Are you doing other things to think about how the threat model changes once that control has been circumvented? Where do they go next? What's next in the graph? And so, uh, again, just an interesting article, interesting thoughts about this idea of recursive threat modeling, not just doing this once, but thinking at various le levels and layers in our system about how does my threat model change now that that particular control has been circumvented where do they go next? What could happen next? What could go wrong? And as he said, you know, controls come with risks. 
and must be treated accordingly. So again, I, I encourage you to take a look at that article and other things that John Lambert has been writing about, just really fascinating stuff about some things that he's thinking about and, and analyzing about what is going on with attackers today. So to wrap up, you know, your challenge, pursue this threat modeling mindset. Don't just let it be something you heard about, but actually something you continue to do. Secure design before new features. Also, let it drive your testing. I find that, especially for testers, uh, for red teams, for others, threat modeling is, a, is absolutely a useful tool to think about the system and how can we, now that we know a better threat model, how can we then test accordingly to find out, is this really true? Or do we have these particular vulnerabilities? Do we have these particular issues in our system that we may never even thought about. And then also threat modeling is going to help you with understanding the bigger picture and that's why I like to, to teach it and help others know about it is because um, I think there's some value in understanding the bigger picture and how things fit together. Lots of resources out there, tools, uh, other tools, and that's uh, my contact info. I have made slides available already. They're available out there so if you're interested uh, go ahead and pick those up. Um, my contact info, I'm on Twitter, I'm also on LinkedIn. If you want to you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, just let me know that you, you know, saw the presentation at, at a B-Sides and um, you know, be happy to connect. Any questions? Yes? Uh, have you seen successfully bringing in like red and blue team information your threat model? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How would you say that about that overwhelming the team? Sure, well, I mean, ideally, you know, to start slow, you want to do, you want to do an easy thing first. You don't want to overwhelm. But as your threat model matures, as you get more information, what I find is that kind of information can come in and help <coughs> refine your threat model. It can certainly help refine the risk. You know, how do I determine risk? Well, I don't know what could happen here. So how do I determine with that? You know, I don't know. But your, your information like that coming in from those teams and say, you know, this is what we are thinking, this is what we're, we know is happening or could happen, I think can help refine your threat model. Another good thing I would mention is there are some work, or is some work rather, being done right now on some tools that allow you to take threat intelligence and plug it into your threat model. So you can build a threat model and then allow some of that threat intelligence to come back and validate what threats that we identify to say are they really true or not. And so that's a really nice way of refining, kind of a completing the circle. So that's another thing I've seen as well. Yes? How does that work? How does it work? Come back and... Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, there is a, um, if you look up, I'll tell you where it first came out, at least I heard about it, it was DevSecCon in Boston. Kevin Green, look up Kevin Green, look up his uh, particular um, uh, keynote, but he pointed to some tools that he's working on, but essentially as I understand it, uh, they go out and look at your system and try to do at least a mapping of what you have, and then you can refine it. And then you plug into you know, any of the threat intelligence tools that are out there and get some data. And then they try to map what they find. Uh, OK, you've identified this firewall or something. And we've identified there's a lot of things that are coming against that firewall. We've identified some things that are real threats and others that are just you know, negatives or whatever. And then try to do that mapping. Now, it's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know all the details, but that's what I understand for what he described, how they're trying to to put it together, and it should be interesting to see as they move along and, and that comes out. Yes, another question. Yeah, so uh, I didn't see in your model, you have proxies and data flow. Yep. Uh, what about deployment models? What if you're using containers? Sure. Uh, how, how do you layer that into that model such that you can start to see what you're seeing in terms of the threat model? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's just a Yeah, mine doesn't include that, but I, I have done that with teams in terms of thinking about deployment and what does that mean. So I just draw a different kind of model or a different type of diagram. Um, I'll point to you that there is a, um, I can't remember the, the NIST number, but there's a new NIST document out there on security of containers, and they actually use what's uh, called a data-centric threat modeling process, and then there's also another NIST <coughs> A document that, that covers that as well. And it's really interesting. So they consider that containers are essentially data. It's holding data. It's holding assets. And so um, I, would, I would follow some of that methodology in terms of maybe looking at assets, looking at ways data is handled, and, uh, and, and go from there. So that may be helpful to see how you could actually do a threat model against containers and deployment and so on. Yes? Two minutes? Okay. 
I, there's some differences. I mean, like, for example, the FAIR approach. Some people do threat modeling through using FAIR, basically, because in that case, in their situation, a threat is considered to be uh, anything that I may have value that I can lose, so like I, a, a numerical value associated with it. So in that case, for example, if I determine that I have a $10,000 threat, but it's $100,000 to fix it, well, then I may not do it. You know, so everything has a dollar value. Uh, so as I see it, I think threat modeling and, and risk management can complement each other. But risk management usually is not focused on applications. Not fo it's focused on more, you know, if I do something, what happens as a result? Whereas threat modeling is more the system. But you need the two. I think you need the two in order to help inform each other. Yes? Quite a bit. I mean, how how is it, or how could it be, or? Yeah, I mean, in your opinion, should, should you take these models and adjust the models? Oh, absolutely. Or yeah. Your absolutely, and I do that all often. I've worked in healthcare. I've worked in finance, and I've I've worked with these different companies and teams to look for the things that make sense for their particular organization. And uh, and for example, I've used the Microsoft Threat Modeling tool, which you can customize for stencils that make sense in the finance, that make sense in the healthcare, and use that. And the same thing with if you're just drawing out things, there are certain things that make more sense in that industry. And that helps everybody get a hold of it, too, if that makes sense. So absolutely. I think that's it. Um, we're going to have lunch here in a moment. So I'll be around for a little bit. I'll be here after lunch uh, for a little while, but then I need to head out. But if you have any questions, um, feel free. Come, come find me. Thank you. <laughs>